All right, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Today we're gonna to continue our discussion of classification. And we are talking about um, particular kind of classification called binary logistic regression. And here we have a two-stage process. The first stage uh, looks a lot like what we did in linear estimation. We have an intercept term B, we have some weights in a vector W, we compute an inner product with our features, and we compute an output we call Z. This is called the score or the discriminant in this case. Second stage is that we threshold Z to output uh, one of our two binary possibilities. For now, we're taking one and minus one as a possibilities, though we could easily do one and zero as well. But one and minus one works out better for a few of the examples that we're going to be doing. So, um, so this is the approach. And um, again, we're doing classification. So that's why our outputs must be binary. And the main question is, how do we design the parameters of our model, B and W? And so the main idea behind binary logistic regression is to use a probabilistic model that says that the probability that the true label equals one given the score Z takes this form. And this is called the sigmoid. It's illustrated down here. You can see that when Z is large and positive, the probability at Y equals one is close to one. When Z is very negative, probability at Y equals one goes to zero. When Z is exactly zero, the probability at Y equals one is 0.5. And then we have the probability that Y is minus one. This is just one minus the probability at Y equals one. So that would look like a mirror image. And one other thing is that sometimes instead of writing it this way, we multiply top and bottom times e to the minus z, and we write it this way. Okay, so again, this is called the sigmoid function. The overall approach here is called binary logistic regression. Um, this is also sometimes called the logistic function. So um, we did a little bit of a uh, Analysis here, we said, you know, okay, how do the, how does the um, intercept term and the weight term affect this? And we saw that basically the weight, the weights, they have the possibility of stretching out or compressing the shape and the intercept acts as like a shift. So instead of transitioning around zero, it could transition around some other number. Okay, so <clears throat> what we were doing uh, when we last stopped was we were saying, okay, so how exactly do we fit the weights given our probabilistic model? And the answer is we apply our maximum likelihood estimation approach. Um, we define our likelihood function, and then we max, we, we find the, the parameters B and W that maximize it. Equivalently, we can maximize the log of this likelihood function, or we could minimize the negative log. So, um, so now we're in a position to go through the, the short derivation here for how exactly we do this for logistic regression. So this is our maximum likelihood estimation procedure. So again, um, our logistic regression model says the probability that Y equals one, given your data and your parameters takes this form. Now this is, I'm putting the subscripts i here because now we're talking about the ith training example. So here we also have the ith score. Similarly, we have the probability that yi equals minus one is this. And finally, always remember that the score is a function of the intercept b and the weights w. Okay, so what we'd like to do is we'd like to maximize this likelihood. <clears throat> So 
the first thing to remember is this is this is the function of all the labels y that we've collected in our data set. So the first step is to say, okay, these data, these labels are statistically independent given x and uh, the parameters. And so we can write this joint probability as a product of the marginal probabilities, the probability for each yi. Second, uh, we often take the negative log of the likelihood because it simplifies our derivation. We're going to do that here. So the negative just manifests here as this negative. What about the log? Well, remember that if you take the log of a product of variables, you end up getting the sum of the logs. So when we take the log of this product, we end up getting the sum of the log of the individual likelihoods. Okay. So the next step is probably the most confusing one. So play, uh, please pay close attention and um, let me know if there's a question on this. So what we have here is we have a, a probability mass function. Remember that in this case, yi only can take on two values. It's either minus one or one. And we have actually two different expressions depending on whether yi is one or minus one. When yi equals one, we have this expression. When yi equals minus one, we have a different expression. Okay, so how do I, how do I merge both of these things? I'll draw a little arrow here. How do I merge both of these things into this one expression. So we're going to use a little trick. I call these uh, switching variables. Okay, so <clears throat> this number yi plus one over two is either one or zero, depending on if yi is one or minus one. So what we can do is we can expand this expression into this larger expression where when yi equals one, this turns on and this turns off. Whereas when yi equals minus one, this turns off and this turns on. So again, let's take a look. So when yi equals one, we said that this is gonna go to one, but then this will go to zero. So this whole term will go away. And so when y equals one, we're gonna have the correct expression, or yeah, we're gonna have the correct form here. Now, when y equals minus one, then this goes to zero. So this whole term goes away. This goes to one, so we just get this. So this is how we can take this single term and expand it into these two different expressions here using these switching variables. The reason we are doing that is that now we can finally plug in the expressions above for these two terms, which are, let's take a look at the first one. What's the log of the probability that y equals one? So we need to take the log of this fraction. So we're gonna get the log of the numerator, which is gonna be, it's gonna cancel the exponent and give us a zi. And then we're gonna get the log or minus the log of the denominator. So that's gonna give us this term. Okay, over here, we look at this expression and we're gonna take the log of that. So that gives us the log of the numerator, log of one is zero, minus the log of the denominator down here. And the rest is really straightforward. It's just, you know, expanding out some things, collecting terms, and after you simplify it, you finally get a nice looking expression down here. You can see that zi manifests in a couple locations. And then the zi is actually what is dependent on your uh, intercept and your weights. So finally, <clears throat> the negative log like, oops, let me see if I can use yellow, the negative log likelihood takes this form down here. 
written as a function of z or zi, but then zi is written in terms of b and w. Turns out that this is the most you can simplify this uh, negative log likelihood. And so finally, we have an optimization problem. We need to find the values of b and w that minimize this expression. <clears throat> so that's something that we need to do with an optimization algorithm. It's not something we can solve for on paper like we did with um, least squares linear regression. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's not in that form. So uh, are there any questions about these switching variables over here that we talked about? So this is, this is the part that most people get confused about. Okay, great. If there's no questions, then hopefully that all makes sense. And we can move on. So now that we know how to fit our um, uh, logistic regression model, we can go back to this example. Let me just scroll back to remind you what happened before. So we were motivating, um, we were saying, why does least squares linear regression not work? So we had this example where we have four data points down the bottom, four data points at the top. We fit uh, least squares linear regression. We take the sign and everything, or th this, is, this is the score that we fit. And then we, we take the sign of the score to get y hat. So anytime score is positive, we get y hat equals one. Anytime the score is negative, we get y hat minus one. Okay, everything works out great for this example. But then if I take that last point and I move it out here, everything falls apart. My least squares regression line gets stretched to the right. The zero crossing comes here. So now all of this I would um, classify as y hat equals minus one. And you can see I would be making a mistake on that training sample. So let's revisit this uh, little experiment here. Um, but now let's, let's look at logistic re regression as well. So here's the least squares linear regression. Here's our four points. Here's our regression line in orange. And then in green, this is y hat. So this is just the sign of the orange line. So anytime you're above zero, sign is one. When the orange is below zero, get the sign of minus one. And as you can see, it's making a mistake on the sample. Okay, what about logistic regression? So if we fit the logistic regression model, we just learned you know, how to fit it. We fit it on these, um, these data points here. And this is the, the Z hat. Um, remember, this is logistic regression. Um, the Z hat is just gonna be logistic regression B plus log logistic regression W times X. That gives us this. And then when you take the sign of that, you get this green curve and you can see the green curve uh, actually also this that's going through the origin here. So everything works out perfectly as we would hope. And we can also plot the probability that Y equals one given X in the red line. And here you can see when X is right here, halfway between those blue dots, the probability is 0.5. So you don't really know how to classify it. However, as it gets to the right of five, then the probability that it equals one is getting closer and closer to one. And as you move to the left, the probability of one gets uh, closer and closer to zero. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so basically what we see here is that uh, least squares gets distracted by that outlier sample while logistic regression is not distracted. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> let's just summarize um, the expression we just derived. So that was, that was this one. 
So here we see sum over all our data samples. And then this is the, the, um, <clears throat> the maximum likelihood cost per data sample. And of course, that's written in terms of Z. And Z is what depends on the parameters. So this expression we derived when Y was one and minus one. Now, another very common thing you'll see in the literature is when y, the, the labels take on the values zero and one. In this case, it's a very similar derivation. All that changes is instead of the switching variables taking <coughs> this form here, they just take the simpler form of yi. Everything else in the derivation is the same. And then you get this expression here. So you have to use the correct expression, you know, depending on whether your labels are one and minus one or zero and one. <clears throat> and this, the name given to this, this is most commonly known is the binary cross entropy loss, or sometimes also is the logistic loss. So this is the optimization problem that we need to solve to um, fit our parameters uh, to our data set. So we'll, we'll talk about how to do this in scikit-learn. It's pretty straightforward. And then in a next unit, unit six, we'll talk more about the optimization algorithms behind this. <clears throat> All right. Any questions so far? All right. So, um, so it's very common to add regularization to that maximum likelihood loss. So similar to what we saw before in the last unit, the two most common forms of regularization are L2, in which case you add this um, alpha times L2 norm of, of your weights, or L1, where you add alpha times the L1 norm of your weights. And in fact, <clears throat> there's a, in a especially important reason to use regularization for um, logistic regression. <clears throat> and it's because when the training data is linearly separable, if you try to minimize this loss without the regularization term, you will find that the values of B and W will just get larger and larger and larger. They'll grow to infinity. And <clears throat> here's the explanation for that. When your data is linearly separable, what happens is the signs on the scores, uh, Z, ZI, they always match the signs on the labels YI. And so, or I guess in, in this case, um, this case we have labels zero and one. So, so let's see. So in this case, whenever you have a label one, Z will be positive. And so what happens is, uh, this term here can get more and more negative as, uh, as B and W grow. Now, this term here is always going to be less than this term. And so as a result, this term will overwhelm the sum. And so you can see that in that case, by just making uh, ZI larger and larger, or B and W larger and larger, you can drive this term here to negative infinity. <clears throat> so it's linearly separable, refer to linear independent or linearly dependent. So linearly separable is something we talked about back here. Linearly separable means that there exists a hyperplane that separates the samples according to their class. So here's a picture of a data set that's linearly separable because I can find these different hyperplanes that separate the class. So in this case, you'll find that, um, yeah, that the, the signs of the, the ZI, or you'll find that YI times ZI is always positive. Okay, hopefully that answers the question. Okay, so, so again, if you don't have this regularization 
and you just optimize this and your data set is linearly separable, um, you, will, you will eventually find that the weights just grow to infinity. However, by putting in this term here, even if alpha is a tiny number, you will prevent that from happening. And so this L2 regularization keeps the, um, the weights finite. So um, in fact, when we, as you'll see, when, when, you, um, when you do this in sklearn, it adds this L2 regularization term here by default. And um, so one option is if you're worried that this is gonna bias your coefficients, you know, shrink them towards the origin, you can just select a value of alpha that's very small. And then you'll get the benefits of this preventing uh, your weights from going to infinity without really much bias at all. Okay, so that's, that's one option is you use L2 regularization. The other option is you use L1 regularization. And in this case, what you'll find is that a subset of the weights will go exactly to zero and you can perform feature selection this way. So um, in some cases, you know, that's definitely what you would like to do. And so you have that option, just like you did with linear, least squares linear regression. Um, and as always, when we think about how do we tune alpha, um, ideally you tune alpha using k-fold cross-validation. Or like I said before, um, if you're too lazy to do that, don't have time, and you just want to kind of remove the effect of regularization, you could use a small uh, alpha to avoid bias. So those are the, the two common options. And you'll see that in the demo and in the lab and so on. All right. So, Using logistic regression and sklearn is exactly the same way that you use um, linear regression in sklearn. The first step is you instantiate a model. Here, you're going to want to tell it the value of the um, regularization to use. Now, let me point out um, in sklearn, you don't specify alpha, you specify the inverse regular regularization strength, which it calls C. So alpha is just, or C is one over alpha. So you, you would like to use a large C to avoid a regularization induced bias. So that's why we are using um, this value here, 1E, 1E5, is just a large value. Um, this way, the L2 regularization that is used by default, here you can see, there it is. Um, this is not going to have much of an effect. Once you instantiate this, um, <clears throat> this estimator, uh, then essentially you just call the fit method. So the fit method, you just give it your training features and training samples, and then it, it optimizes, um, it, you know, it minimizes this expression here and stores the parameters internally. Now, because of this, um, because of the fact that there's this, uh, these, these regularization penalties by default, it's a good idea to always do some sort of standardization to your data. And that's what this step is doing here. So there are a few other options um, that you can use with this, this method. So um, I don't know if any of them are. So let, let me talk about just maybe a couple of important ones. So the solver refers to which optimization um, algorithm is used to minimize this. And liblinear is a pretty good choice. Um, there are a few, there are some other ones that might have advantages in certain, uh, certain scenarios. You can specify things like the number, max number of iterations that that solver does. You can tell it, if you don't want to fit the intercept term, you can tell it that. Um, 
You can tell it the tolerance at which the solver should stop. And warm start is, uh, if you're gonna be calling this, uh, this model several times, like you're gonna be doing k-fold cross-validation, what warm start will do is every time it retrains it, it will start from the previous uh, value that it found the last time you trained it. So it doesn't start from scratch. And so that can save time um, when you're doing many optimizations in a row. Okay. So <clears throat> anyway, on the when we run this on the demo, we get you know 97%, which is an improvement. Um, well, let's see, I think this is probably the first time, the first time we're using it uh, on this demo. So we can compare this to other things we do later. All right. And uh, as we discussed before, because we're using linear regression, the boundaries, the, the, the classification boundary in the raw feature space will be linear. So if you want to somehow make a um, nonlinear boundary, it's possible to do that by first transforming your features. For example, like to get this boundary, we said, okay, what you do is you can take the square, some of the squares of your two features, and then just um, you know, work on the radius. And now this is a constant radius. You know, with that new feature, we can use uh, linear regression to get this non-linear boundary in the original parameter space. Another option is one-hot coding. Just as we learned in linear regression, we can use that here as well. Okay, so um, so that that covers our discussion of binary logistic regression. Next. Let's get into what we call multi-class classification, where um, <clears throat> so we're really focusing here on the case that k is greater than two classes. When k is exactly equal to two classes, we can use binary classification. But when there's more than two classes, that's that needs to be treated differently. So um, so here's just a visual example of a data set with two features. And you can see there's K equals 10 different classes. You know, there's blue pluses and red asterisks and so on. And these are the classification boundaries that were learned by a given method. As you can see, these boundaries are not linear. So that means that this method was either a nonlinear classifier or it was trained um, with or it was a linear classifier trained with some sort of nonlinear processing of those two features to get these curved boundaries. Okay, so mathematically, you can say that the goal is we're given training data x, y pairs. Um, and in this case, the labels are numbers between one and capital K. And then we would like to classify a test vector X as uh, Y in one through K. And the main difference is compared to when we did this for regression, this target Y is categorical. So in regression, we had the situation where, you know, YI was uh, typically a real number from a continuum. Now it's these particular numbers one through K, but we really need to think of these numbers as categories. This is, these are not ordinal numbers. This is the, so in other words, um, we should interpret these as things like cats, dogs, cows, and so on that are not ordered. That they don't have a particular ordering with respect to each other. We represent them represent them as numbers just because that's convenient, but these numbers are not meant to be ordered. They're really just categories. Um, so for example, just 
I, I write this on the bottom of the slide. If you have a problem, uh, a, a data science problem where you're given uh, discrete numbers like one through K that you know are ordered. So let's say somehow you measure uh, how many star ratings a product gets where it's either gets one star, two stars, up to five stars. In that case, you have discrete labels, but they are ordered. It is one is less than two stars, two stars is less than three stars and so on. So you really do have a regression problem. You should think about that as a regression problem. So if the target is discrete, but ordinal, it's probably a regression problem. Okay, what we're talking about now is that these are different categories that are not ordinal. So we, we can't think of it as a regression problem. We have to treat it differently. We treat it as a classification problem. So we would like to design a classifier, some, uh, some function that operates on our feature vector X that returns Y hat. And Y hat is going to be one of those K categories. We would like that Y hat equals the true Y with high probability. So just as we did with, um, we talked about uh, binary classification, we can think in terms of decision regions, but now there's gonna be K, capital K different decision regions. And so these, these decision regions, we, we can visualize over here on the right. Okay, so um, I think that's kind of the high level description. The main point is that we're working on a categorical target problem now, which is different from what we saw when we did regression. All right. Any questions on that? Okay. So there's many, many different ways to do multi-class classification, but we would like to know, is it possible to repurpose our binary classifiers and Maybe put together a number of binary classifiers to do multi-class classification? And the answer is yes, um, we can. So we can tackle it using binary methods. And basically there's, um, okay, there's one approach we can think about doing is voting. So what, what would happen is you would have a number of binary classifiers. And let me give you one example of this. Maybe you have a binary, so-called one versus rest binary classifiers. So here, the picture shows, shows it well. You build, so this is a, a, a problem where you have three classes. You can see one, two, and three. So one kind of binary classifier I could build is one versus the rest, one versus two and three. So this is where this boundary would be. I could also build a classifier that's two versus the rest. So two versus the rest. And I could build another classifier that's three versus the rest. So now I have these three different classifiers, but all binary. So if I want to use a voting approach, what I would do is I would put in my new data points. Uh, for example, maybe, maybe this is a new data point here. I put this in and I see, okay, how did it, how did it do on this? How, how did this classifier rate it? So this classifier would have said, it's not three. What about this classifier? This classifier would have said, it's not one. And then this classifier would have said, it's not two. So here you can see that there are some problems with these voting methods because these points would have been um, classified as not one, not two, or not three, which means, you know, what are they? So basically, voting is not a good approach. Um, it leads to ambiguities. So a slight fix to this is instead of voting based on hard outcomes, you know, like this classifier saying, it's either one or not one, have this classifier report a confidence value, like a real number, for example, like the score, Z. And in this case, what you can do is you can measure the score, 
for this classifier, you know, how, how likely is it that this is from class one? How likely is it that the sample is from class two? How likely is it that the sample is from class three? And whichever has the highest score, you, you choose that. So we'll, we'll call this choosing the highest confidence value. And this is a very good approach we'd like to use. So again, here we're doing the one versus rest, choosing the highest confidence value. Um, <clears throat> there is another approach too called one versus one. And in that case, what you do is for every pair of classes, K and L, you build a separate uh, classifier. So for example, here we have uh, three classes. So we would build the one versus three, one versus two, and two versus three classifiers. And here too, when you do voting, you have issues with ambiguities, but if you use the confidence value approach, it is possible to do this without ambiguities. In any case, we are gonna focus on um, this <clears throat> confidence value, one versus rest approach. And we're gonna look in particular at an approach called multinomial, which is regression in more detail. Okay, so that's the next section. So again, what we're doing here is we're combining multiple binary linear classifiers using that one versus rest confidence value approach. And here's the overall two-step approach to this problem over here. So first, for each class, oops, for each class K, going from one to big K, we're gonna compute a linear score ZK. Now notice that this score, we have a separate score for each class. And this score indicates whether X is in class K or not in class K. So we do this for every one of the classes up to capital K. And we just choose the one that gives the, the K that gives the largest score Z. Okay, so this is basically two stage approach. <clears throat> so it's very similar to the, um, the two stage approach for binary linear classification that we did before, except there we had a single score and now we have capital K scores and we choose the index of the maximum score. Okay, so that's the approach. The next question is, how do we design the coefficients? So notice that actually we have multiple sets of coefficients now. So for the kth score, I'm gonna use the kth intercept and the kth sequence of weights. So we can put those weights together into this vector WK. And now I have BK and WK for every class up to class capital K. So how do I, how do I train these weights? Basically there's two options, option one, option two. <clears throat> option one, is that we train K separate binary logistic regression models. So what that would mean is similar to this picture, you first take your data set and you, you create, uh, let's say class one, not class one, and you train this binary logistic regression model like that. Then you're done with that. Now you train another one where you take class two, not class two, train this model and so on. So you separately train each of those classifiers. But there's another approach. The other approach is <clears throat> to jointly train them all together by maximizing a likelihood function that combines everything together. And here, this likelihood function takes this form So this is an extension of the um, logistic, the binary logistic likelihood we saw before, 
to capital K classes. So, okay. So here you see that the probability that Y comes from class K, you put the score of the class K up there, and then this you're summing over the exponentiated scores of all the classes. <clears throat> and you can think of this as just a normalization factor because we want the sequence of these probabilities for the different Ks to all sum up to one as they need to to be a valid probability mass function. This normalization ensures that, okay? So the really interesting part, if we just say, okay, the normalization is just there to normalize, then really this is just the interesting part is what's in the numerator. So it says that these different probabilities are just normalized versions of the exponentiated scores. So that's the intuition. <clears throat> so this thing is known as the soft max. So the reason why it's called the soft max is that when you look at the value of that ratio, in the case that one of the scores is much larger than the others, then <clears throat> this guy will go to one approximately for the largest score and go to zero approximately for all the indices of all the smaller scores. <clears throat> so this is, this is why it's known as a soft max. It's kind of like um, telling you which is the, which is the index of the maximum score. And it's telling you that by creating a one hot vector with a one at the index of the largest score. Okay, so this is uh, two different approaches for, um, for how to train this multinomial log logistic regression model. And we're gonna focus on this one because, well, I guess this, this first approach, we already know how to do it. So let's look closer at how to solve this maximum likelihood problem. So again, <clears throat> our objective is to design all these intercept terms and all these different weight vectors. So we can stack the intercept terms into a vector, stack the weight vectors into a matrix, and we want to do we want to fit those parameters using maximum likelihood estimation. <clears throat> so we know that that means we want to find the B and W that maximize the likelihood or minimize the negative log likelihood. <clears throat> so the only slightly tricky thing has to do with those switching variables that we used previously for the binary case. So what we do in this case <clears throat> is we essentially use one hot coding to solve this problem. So on one hand, we can think of our targets, yi, as labels between one, integer labels between one and capital K. But another way we can uh, represent those targets is by coding them into a binary vector. And so <clears throat> notice that this is a bold face yi, and this is non-bold. So when this guy takes on the value little k, then this vector will have a one in the little k place and have zeros in all the other places. Okay, so this is just a way of one hot coding this integer. So this is essentially the trick we need to use, the kind of switch variable trick. And if you, if you write out the individual entries of this vector, we can call them yik. So i, as always, refers to the index of the data sample in our data set. And now k is going to refer to the location within this vector. You can see that yik is 1. If k is yi, that's what we're saying, it's if it's the yith entry. Otherwise, the value is 0. Okay, and this is true for all data samples i. Okay, so now that we have this set up, what we can do is we can write an expression for this term here. So we want to look at the negative log of that 
value, this likelihood value. But again, the challenge is that this takes on, it has a different expression depending on the value of yi. If you remember, essentially this is, this is the expression here where the value k here is yi. So <clears throat> that gets, um, yeah. So, so in order to resolve this, we say, okay, here are my switching variables. So when yi equals k, I'm going to either multiply it by a zero or a one. And in particular, this is gonna turn on uh, when the, kth entry in this vector is one. And in that case, I can plug, I can plug in this probability from the previous page, which is this. And, um, and so now we have a way of writing this log likelihood in terms of these scores, zik. We said that zik is, um, this is the, the score for the ith sample of the the kth, um, kth score i sample, which we know we build from the kth intercept term, the kth weight vector, and the i training feature vector. The, the, the rest is pretty straightforward. You just take the log of this ratio. So the, the numerator, the log cancels the exponent. You just get zik. And then the denominator, you get log you get minus log of this over here. And <clears throat> this is all inside this sum. One little simplification we can make is that because this term is not a function of the summing variable little k, we can pull this in front of the sum and then uh, where, that, where that vacated, you're gonna have the sum over the yik's. And because this is a one hot vector, no matter what k is, the sum always goes to one. So that means you're gonna get log of this term out front, and then the main term is minus this term here. So this is, uh, this is the term that's inside the sum over i, and the very last step is we, we plug that into the sum over i, and we finally get this expression, this is the maximum likelihood problem we need to solve in order to design the weights and the uh, um, intercept terms in the multi-class case. <clears throat> this is known as cross entropy loss. And um, yeah, th this, is, this is basically as much as we can simplify the negative log likelihood. This is something we need now to use a numerical optimization algorithm to solve, but it's, it's possible, it's, it's not an issue. And um, finally, we can add L2 regularization or L1 regularization. We just have to be careful because W is a matrix. When we do L2 regularization, we have to call it by the Frobenius norm, not the two norm. And with L1 regularization, we can just call it by the, the one norm because the one norm for a matrix and vector is the same. And as always, you can tune alpha the regularization weight using cross-validation. Okay. So again, there's no possible way to simplify further, but this is what's known as a convex optimization problem. And that means it can be straightforwardly solved numerically. And we'll learn more about those methods in the next unit. But suffice it to say for now, we, we can just solve it with sklearn. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so how do we do this in sklearn? Using exactly the same functions before. This logis logistic regression method, it handles both binary and multi-class classification. It knows what to do based on how many different values are in the y vector. And as before, you can see that it here, you can select which penalty you wanna use. You can select the strength, the inverse regularization strength on that penalty. You can select the solver 
But one thing that's particularly important to talk about now is this multi-class option. So this is the option that tells us whether we want to, okay, so if you select multinomial, then you jointly design the intercepts and the weights according to this uh, multinomial logistic regression approach described in the last few pages. In other words, it solves, it solves this problem here. So you're designing all these things jointly all together. On the other hand, you could also choose to set it as OVR, which means one versus rest. And in this case, for each little k, which is the, the class index, you separately design a one versus rest binary classifier using binary logistic regression. So again, these are the two um, options. I think before I called, gave them those numbers. These are the two options we have um, at our disposal when we do <clears throat> multinomial or multi-class logistic regression. And what you'll find is that MLR has slightly better performance, but it can take significantly longer to train. So if you have a, a small data set, um, it's very easy to use MLR, but if you have a very big data set, it might take a while to run it. In that case, you might be tempted instead to use OVR. So um, yeah, that's, that's all I wanted to talk about today. Um, are there any questions, anything you'd like me to cover again? We have a few more minutes. Um, I had a question. Sure. So in the logistic regression, in one of the past homeworks, we were able to show that we can manipulate both sides of the transformations to make it look like a linear regression problem. Why don't we use the, the A, the matrix A times A transpose inverse times A transpose like we did in linear regression? Yeah, so with linear regression, the, the loss is quadratic. So you, so you basically have, um, we, saw it, we saw it back here. Um, it, it's it's kind of compressed, but <clears throat> linear regression, you can think of having this likelihood that's Gaussian, in which case the negative log likelihood is quadratic and quadratic problems you can solve in closed form. Like you say, you can write this out. You get, um, you get A transpose A inverse A transpose Y. So this is beta hat ML. And it's as simple as that. <clears throat> Unfortunately, in this problem here, it's not so simple. There's just no way to, um, to manipulate this further to figure out, you know, on paper exactly what these weights are. So it's just a, a more difficult problem. Does that answer the question? Uh, sort of, I, I was like, mostly wondering why can't we do a transformation on both sides to get the logistic regression and then solve, solve it with the, the normal way after we do the transformation. Um, yeah, I'm not, I guess I'm not sure. I'm not sure what, what transformation you're thinking of. So, because what we want to do for, for fitting our parameters, we want to essentially, you know, maximize the likelihood. So that's, that's what we start with. This is, we want to maximize this expression. And so that's, you know, we just go step by step and then we end up getting this thing we want to maximize. So I don't know if what you're talking about is, is more like going back to, to something like this, but you know, this, no, nothing here tells us how to fit the parameters. This is all like assuming you know them. I don't know if I'm, I'm not exactly sure what you, what you meant by transforming and all that. Uh, I believe on one of the homeworks, 
we had to show that um, we could transform uh, a fraction where it was like P divided by one plus gamma E to the negative alpha T. We had to show that that was a linear transformation. I think you're talking about maybe back in homework one, there was a nonlinear model that you could kind of rewrite as a linear model. Yeah. Is that, yeah, right. So um, yeah, again, like, uh, so I guess there's, there's two things. So when you do that, um, you're actually kind of changing the model a bit and the parameters that you're finding would be the, you know, least squares optimal parameters on the linear model, but that does not mean that they're the optimal parameters, the least squares optimal parameters in the nonlinear model. And that's one comment. Um, but even here, uh, it's not it's not exactly clear. You see, like this, this is really the model that we have here, right? So, so this this stuff doesn't actually show up um, directly here at all. This stuff only shows up this this kind of stuff that's causing us trouble. This shows up only in the likelihood, and at that point, it's just an optimization problem. You know, we just want to maximize this. So it. So I'm not even sure how I would apply what you're suggesting to this situation. But I do remember what you're talking about that that particular homework problem. Okay, I, I think that makes sense. Yeah, but if if you want to follow up, uh, uh, you know, think about it more and follow up, that's fine. I can, I can go over it sometime later. Does anybody have any other questions on anything today? All right. Well, if not, that's good. Uh, I hope to be back um, in person on Wednesday. Uh, my the floor uh, that that my office on is on was flooded, and so um, none of the computers are connecting to the internet. And I haven't actually been in there yet to see what the damage is, but. Um, so for now, it's, it's just easier for me to avoid my, my office. So that's, that's why uh, we're online today. All right, guys, I'll see you on, um, on Wednesday then. Have a good one.